Welcome to the University of Maine, and welcome to this panel discussion titled The University of Maine's Role in the National Geographic and Rolex's Perpetual Planet Extreme Expedition to Mount Everest. These six adventurous scientific, scientific explorers are here today to share their experiences, successes, and challenges during their approximate two months last spring on and around the world's highest mountain. My name is Beth Staples and I'll be moderating the panel today and it's my pleasure now to introduce University of Maine President Joan Farini Mundy. She became the 21st President of the University of Maine and its regional campus, the University of Maine at Machias, in July 2018. In her first year, President Farini Mundy initiated the strategic vision and values planning process for UMaine and UMM. And she led a University of Maine system process culminating in a five-year strategic plan for research and development. She serves on the boards of Maine Center Ventures and Maine and & Company, and she's the Academic Advisory Team Chair for Focus Maine. President Farini Mundy serves on the Strategic Working Team for Governor Mills' Economic Development Plan and as a member of a Mathematics Standards Review Steering Committee for the Maine Department of Education. Prior to coming to Maine, she was the Chief Operating Officer of the National Science Foundation. Her distinguished career spans the fields of mathematics education, STEM education and policy, teacher education, and research administration. Among her awards and recognitions are the U.S. Senior Executive Service Presidential Rank Award of Dis Distinguished Executive, and election as a fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Mathematical Society. President Farini Mundy is a member of the Board on Higher Education and Workforce of the National Academies. She holds a PhD in Mathematics Education from the University of New Hampshire. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited that we are able to be here together for, for what is um, going to be a very special event, and I'm especially pleased that I get the honor of introducing Paul Majewski. Uh, Dr. Majewski is the Director of the Climate Change Institute and Distinguished Professor in the School of Earth and Climate Sciences, also the School of Marine Sciences, the School of Policy and International Affairs, and the Center for Ocean and Coastal Law in the University of Maine Law School. So why don't you just keep track of how many things I just said there, um, because I'd like to come back to that theme in a moment. Um, Paul has led 55 expeditions to the most remote and extreme reaches of our planet. Um, and there are a couple of descriptors of Paul that I, uh, I found in one of the more recent articles about the Everest trip. One is, and this is in case you don't know which person is Paul, but he'll disclose himself in a minute. A bearded 72-year-old with youthful features and unkempt silver hair. <laughs> That's all over there. Um, and beyond that, um, this insightful descriptive phrase that goes like this. Paul, Paul said um, about his own, his own background, I always wanted to be an adventurer, an explorer first. It wasn't until 10 years after I earned my PhD that I began to think of myself as a scientist. I actually get annoyed that most people think of scientists as being lab nerds. <laughs> a fantastic spokesperson for science. Um, he's going to lead um, our discussion today and introduce you to the colleagues who made the, made the trip to Everest. Um, his resume is extraordinary, and you all can find it online. Uh, major honors from every organization imaginable uh, relative to his scientific work. 430 peer-reviewed publications. I was trying to figure out if there was an average number of publications professors for professors, and um, I couldn't find one. This is way more than that, whatever that <laughs> number is. Uh, and he was the leader and lead scientist in the National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Planet Extreme Expedition to Mount Everest, which is what we will hear about today. I also need to tell just a little bit of a, of a more personal story about Paul. Um, he was at the University of New Hampshire from 1975 through 2000. And I don't think I really knew Paul there. I was a student during part of that time and on the faculty during part of that time, but I certainly knew about him. And the reason I knew about him is that one of my very favorite professors in the mathematics department, a person named Dave Meeker, had become Paul's collaborator quite early on. And Dave himself, also an extraordinary scholar, 
And they found um, one of their earliest papers, a 1993 paper titled Ice Core Sulfate from Three Northern Hemisphere Sites, Source and Temperature Forcing Implications. What I understood of what the work was at that time from Dave Meeker, who was my professor there at UNH, was um, around, um, around quantitative analyses of the ice core samples, and Paul can certainly tell us more if, if appropriate, uh, where Dave and Paul were collaborating from their respective fields and expertise, um, bringing together disciplines that jointly that were able to lead to new techniques, new discoveries, new ways of uh, doing analysis. And um, Dave Meeker was well known as a t at the time as an applied mathematician, always interested in new applications, and clearly he worked in this area with Paul. But um, more importantly, Paul's career is, uh, exemplifies the notion of what we today call convergence in research. This notion that to solve problems will require bringing together scientists and engineers and scholars from a whole host of areas, and he has been a model of that over the decades of his incredibly distinguished career. I was trying to think about whether there was any kind of university or, 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 or sort of token to, to present to Paul, and the best I could come up with was my own only marginal intersection. I've mentioned the Dave Meeker intersection, that is one. But the other is that I, I had the good fortune to visit Antarctica um, and the South Pole when I was at um, the National Science Foundation, so I brought back a bobblehead. You might have one, Paul, but here's another one for you, uh, just in case. It's a pleasure to introduce Paul Mayevsky. Well, thank you so much, President Freddie Mundy. It's uh, wonderful to have you in the university. Uh, at, at there's a, it's a fairly standard route from the University of New Hampshire to, to the University of Maine. There are actually other people in the audience who've done exactly the same thing. Um, let me just get this, make sure it works. Uh, there we go. Oops. So the, the very best thing um, about the work that we get to do, and, and you'll meet the other five people from the university who were involved in this program, is, uh, oops, that's the wrong one, sorry. The very, we get to travel all over the world, fantastic places, uh, obviously have a lot of students involved with it, and it can be a very important, life-changing experience for them, but I've got to say this one other thing that's even better, and it's coming back to a group like this. We really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time uh, to come and hear about our expedition. We're, we're very proud to be involved, and we're very proud to have been, uh, represented at the University of Maine. So I'll try in about 12 minutes to go very quickly through uh, an overview. You saw the, the, uh, the video uh, that was done by Adam uh, Kierkegaard, Ron Lisnett, and Beth Staples. Uh, I think it'll be showing again. There's some equipment up here that you can view that comes from Aaron Putnam's group, the Glacial Geology Group, and, uh, and Mario Kutowski, who you will hear about in a couple of minutes, his drilling on the top of, uh, top of Everest. The, uh, I think the first question, however, is does anybody actually remember the name of this expedition? <laughs> because I have a lot of trouble remembering. Anyway, it was supported by National Geographic and Rolex, uh, and it was the very first scientific expedition of its type. Uh, National Geographic is particularly, as are scientists in general, interested in what are called water towers. And the Himalayas are a large water tower. They store water in the glaciers. And there are on the order of about 60,000 glaciers in the Himalayas. Uh, and these glaciers are fed by moisture that comes from the monsoon. Uh, this is a NASA. Uh, actually, that's real imagery that's being painted for the color of the the chemistry in the area. The monsoon brings water in, and that monsoon, how far north it can go into the Himalayas, allowing moisture to be deposited to preserve glaciers and produce glaciers, depends to a great degree on the strength of the jet stream. And that is the very same jet stream that passes over us uh, on its way offshore. And that's the very same jet stream that's going through all of this irregular behavior right now as a consequence of warming in the Arctic. We'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. Working in high places is uh, phenomenal. Uh, when you get above 15,000 feet, this happens to be about 21,000 feet. Very often you're above the mountains. Uh, the air is absolutely clear. 
you can see obviously long distances and in this particular case this was 1980 uh, we were close to the border with Pakistan and at night uh, we could see sparks in the air and this was the artillery fire between the Soviet Union uh, and the Afghan uh, people however when you're climbing up this high you really are absolutely in your own world uh, the oxygen at base camp uh, which we'll talk about in a minute it's about 17 and a half thousand feet is 50 percent of what we have at sea level and when you get the, to the top of Everest it's 35 percent of what you have at sea level quite remarkable and you literally no matter how well trained you are no matter how fit you are you literally are in a world of your own walking along looking at one foot after another and just thinking to yourself I hope I can get to that sign that says University of Maine and when you get there you pick something else that you get to and you just keep going uh, and you try to make sure that you're uh, staying as fit and concentrating. Now, to do science at the same time, it's one thing to get up to these mountain ranges. It's another thing, uh, considerably more uh, complicated, to actually be thinking about what you're doing and collect good science. So the glaciers in the Himalayas, this one is a beautiful NASA image taken uh, over uh, Bhutan by satellite. Obviously, the white is snow and glaciers. The blue are the portions of the glaciers where met there is more mass loss uh, during the year than there is gain. Those areas are getting larger and larger. The glaciers in the Himalayas are shrinking quite rapidly. And if you look carefully, you'll see at the edge of many of those glaciers, black features, those are lakes. And in the last 20 years, on the order of about 900 new lakes have formed in the Himalayas. These lakes are critically important because they tell us the glaciers are melting. They're critically important because as they begin to fill up, and they're typically held in by ice. When that ice melts, the water makes its way down very rapidly, and thousands of people uh, can be killed, and certainly have been killed in the past. So climate change is a true reality for the people who live in this area and for their water tower. And that water tower is critically important not only for water consumption for humans, but hydroelectric power, agriculture, many, many other things. My wife Lynn is here, and when my wife Lynn and I uh, visited a small village, well actually it's a small building on the top of the picture here in 1995, that's all there was in this little village. And if you see the arrow coming down, that's where that building is today. Uh, entire villages have begun to spread up as a con spread out as a concept of tourism. <coughs> Mount Everest is the iconic mountain in the world. That's the reason National Geographic chose it. That's the reason that we've had expeditions there in the past, particularly coming from uh, from the north side, so what, through what says the Rongbu. On this particular expedition, we came through the Kungu from the south. And it's such an iconic mountain that it has several different names. It's Mount Everest in the western world, Chomolongma and Sagamantha, depending on whether or not you live in Tibet, China, or, or Nepal. Last, a year ago this last March, I was contacted by the National Geographic Society, with whom I had actually not had very much to do in the past. Uh, and asked to take a leadership role for the expedition, which was a tremendous honor and a great opportunity uh, to basically put together a remarkable group of scientists uh, and young students. And it is part of a program that's called Life at the Extremes. The first year, they're studying mountains, of which this was the marquee expedition. There's a couple of smaller expeditions going on. The next year, they'll be looking at rainforests, the lungs, of the planet, and then after that they'll be looking at the ocean, the food source of the planet. So between water towers, water for the planet, lungs for the planet, and food for the planet, uh, you can see why they say life at extremes. Mount Everest is, an, and this expedition, is an absolutely unprecedented opportunity to view areas above 5,000 meters, 16,000 feet. Very few people get up here, and almost no scientists get up here. We know very little about what's going on. And it's an opportunity to touch the <coughs> jet stream that goes over the top of Everest and eventually makes its way to us, and to understand how it has changed over time. There are several different programs, uh, or disciplines, I should say, that were involved in this activity uh, that I was fortunate enough to lead, meteorology, uh, glaciology, atmospheric and hydrospheric composition, glacial geology, biology, and glacier mapping. This particular project by itself set a world record by being the most intense scientific effort ever taken, undertaken 
in the region. And that red star, it looks black to me from here, but I hope it looks red to you. That red star in the top, it will pop up every now and then, and it'll show you all of the world records uh, that were attained by this project, uh, some of which are directly a consequence of the University of Maine activities. Uh, this is a map that shows you that, uh, how in the months of April and May, uh, uh, May, all of the area that we covered on the right side without going into detail, it shows you all of the different measurements. We went into several different valleys, started at 3,000 meters, and the team made its way up to 8,400 meters. Uh, one of these projects, this particular one uh, led by Aaron Putnam from our university and Peter Strand, his graduate students, Peter Strand and Laura Mattis, who you'll be uh, speaking to in a little while, uh, was intended to be looking at glacial lake cores and also taking, examining rocks, finding how long they had been exposed to the surface in order to determine what the former dimension of dimensions of the glacier, this, in this particular case, the Kumbu Glacier, which drains directly <coughs> off the south side of Mount Everest. There's a glaciology team, which included Marish Poptowski, Heather Clifford, myself, and we're the ones in blue because we're from the University of Maine. Uh, and the ones in black are the other people involved, primarily Nepalese uh, people, uh, students, ne Nepalese fa uh, faculty. We collected ice cores, water samples, snow samples. We were interested in understanding what the pollute loading was in this area because when the glaciers melt, they give off a tremendous uh, slug of chemistry. And if that chemistry is toxic, which it certainly has been in certain parts of the world, it has a very big effect on the ecosystem, what sort of vegetation you can have. It was also a biology program. I don't have a pretty picture, picture for it right now, but that program installed uh, four biodiversity sites, the highest ever put in the world. These biodiversity sites are, intend, are, are put in and then they're revisited on a fairly regular basis in order to be able to see what's there and how it's changed. These are indicators of climate change. And this particular uh, project also discovered two new, uh, found the highest elevation for two types of insects. I should have put world records on that. I forgot to, sorry. Uh, there was also a mapping project. Uh, and in this particular mapping project, it's the most detailed form of mapping ever conducted in the Mount Everest area. And it's the highest that a helicopter has ever gone in order to collect detailed data. The people who were doing the mapping uh, used several different bases. They used helicopter, ground-based, uh, drone-based. Aaron and his team were involved in some of this too. And they told me, uh, the primary team that did this told me that they were, uh, they had collected in the time that they were there, this is what they said, I'm not sure it's true, but they said that they collected more information than the Hubble telescope collects in one year. Seems unbelievable, but that's what they said. So uh, before we start making our way up from base camp, because many of the projects were at base camp or lower than base camp, uh, we should point out another world record, um, and I took the liberty, I hope the president doesn't mind that I did this, uh, of uh, Aaron and I represented the University of Maine and awarded degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees. It turns out that Laura Mattis was the valedictorian of the Everest region, uh, and the president was the highest graduating master's student in the Everest region too. And they've both done extremely well and, and are still with our program. So now we'll start to make our way up the ice fall. This is a phenomenal picture. If you look in the bottom here, the little uh, yellow specks are the tents at base camp. Believe it or not, there are about a thousand people that live in base camp during the climbing season, of which several hundred actually try to make an attempt to the top. It's pretty crowded. It's a strange place. It's very different than the remote areas that we're used to in the past. You'll notice what looks like a, a white light going up the mountain that's going up over what's called the Kumbu Ice Fall, and in order to train uh, to get eventually to the top, you go up and down the Kumbu Ice Fall three times, and then gradually make your way back up after acclimatizing. The reason it's light is because they start out early in the day, and what you're seeing are their headlamps light, uh, lighting the route. And if you look on the right side of this picture, you'll see how much fun it is to go up the Kumbu Ice Fall in the middle of uh, the night uh, with the lamp glistening off the ice, and you'll see actually how crowded it was. Mount Everest is a very different place than most mountains we were, uh, and everybody is interested in climbing it, and very often you have to wait online, and that made the science even more complicated, because again, the people in this team were not there to climb Mount Everest. They were there to collect science. Uh, 
This is what the camp looks like at 21,000 feet at the top of the ice fall, all small tents, typically two or three people in there. And then once you get up to 26,000 feet, you're what's called the South Call. And the South Call also has a small camp, beginning to see fewer and fewer tents, obviously, the higher you go. And the people who go from the previous uh, campsite up to the top wait for a special window before they can go up. And that window comes typically in the last two weeks of May. And within that time period, it lasts this particular season. The first short window was two and a half days, which wasn't enough time for our science team to get up and do the work they wanted. And the second window was four days that turned into three and a half days because the winds were so strong. So we were constantly monitoring uh, the weather in this area. And Sean Burkle here, no, nope, maybe not. Sean Burkle, uh, mainstay climatologist in our institute, was sending an awful lot of the information to help us with that. So once you have gotten to the south call, typically people spend one night there, get up early in the morning and go and race for the top. Our team spent two nights there. We're prepared to spend three nights, and here are the things that they did. They put in the highest automatic weather stations in the world. Uh, and you can see the list of where all of the lower ones come from, making, we should have done the other way around, making their way down to the highest one. Uh, they're wearing the same suit that Mario has left here, oxygen uh, masks, and carrying very small loads, typically just their own oxygen. One 10 kilo tank of oxygen is enough for about uh, four hours on Everest, so typically you need quite a few in order to be able to last for a few days. Uh, the reason for this, for in placing these weather stations, is nobody knows what's really going on in terms of the weather above 15,000 feet. And from a particularly practical point of view, when climbers start to go up, you can give a, you can give them the very best information. Right now or until now, it was all based on models, and these weather stations are going to tell us how closely those models actually approximate what's going on. Thus far, the models have actually done quite well. What's going to happen, of course? once we go into the winter, uh, and this will be, it's a very important demonstration of uh, how well climate models work at elevation, which is important for us to make better predictions of the climate. The other thing that happened, which was a world record, um, Mario was just uh, short of about 27,000 feet, 8,020 meters, and he drilled the highest ice core in the world. These ice cores allow us to reconstruct past temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation, whether or not there are pollutants in the air, a variety of all, of all sorts of things. And here's a close-up, that's Mario with the very same drill uh, that's over there with the suit on, uh, and he did an absolutely remarkable job. Went down 10 meters, uh, 10 meters is not necessarily a, a great depth. At this elevation, it's a phenomenal depth. And to get it done in about two hours, which is about as much time as you have uh, to exert you, is quite remarkable. If you look carefully in the left-hand side along the ridge, you will see, if you count them, close to 200 people that were actually online in front of our science team. No matter how early they got up in the morning, it was really impossible for them to get ahead of the crowds. And if you calculate that each one of them will spend one minute on the top of Everest, that's just, that's pretty conservative, that's 200 minutes, and that's almost a bottle of oxygen right there. So the climbing team uh, was led by a ex highly experienced Sherpa uh, by the name of Panuro Sherpa. He uh, summited 17 times, and the climbing team, in concert with the, our base camp program, said this really wasn't worth it. Uh, they got up to 8,400 meters as opposed to 8,800 meters, which is quite remarkable. So why did we go to Everest? Uh, we went to Everest because, as I mentioned, it's a water tower. It supplies 20% of the world's population with water. As this water begins to melt, it can create tremendous hazards in the region. Everything from uh, outburst floods of these lakes uh, to tremendous instabilities in the slopes. And you can only imagine how steep the slopes are in these areas and where people live. So these, these areas are, as it warms and as there is more water available, will be changing. Their health, as it warms, vector-borne diseases, the same thing that happens in Maine, it's beginning to affect these people. Their health is also impacted by the fact that water quality may change as these glaciers begin to uh, emit uh, toxic substances. We went there because we understand, want to understand the jet stream, as I mentioned before. We want to be able to make better climate predictions for the future, which is the primary goal of our institute. And we want to help these people to be able to sustain their society. It's primarily based on tourism 
agriculture, uh, and in order for them to be able to do that, they're very smart. They know exactly what's happening, but we're hoping that with the tools that we have, we'll be able to give them the thing that they can't do themselves, and if that is make better predictions and help them plan about the things that they, should, they could be doing. None of this would have been possible without an awful lot of other people. There was a large uh, group of Sherpas that came with us. I have the privilege of spending four years at the University of New Hampshire with a with the son of Norgay Tenzing, the man who climbed Everest, along with uh, Edmund Hillary, who was my student for four years. But in addition to that, were amazing, amazing media people. Uh, and every single shot that you see, keep in mind that there's somebody with a heavy camera, not just a little iPhone, but with a super heavy camera running up, up in front and around and taking pictures. We had a, an amazing team. And uh, thank you for coming. Awesome, thank you, Paul. Let's meet the five other members of this team. Um, Heather Clifford, she's pursuing her PhD at UMaine studying climate and pollution in high mountain regions, including the Peruvian Andes, Swiss Alps, and Himalaya. Heather grew up on Cape Cod, and she's always had an affinity for the environment. She received her bachelor's degree in environmental engineering at Clemson University and a master's in climate science from UMaine. With her research, she aims to better understand pollution and climate change in high mountain regions. Heather, do you want to give a wave? <laughs> and Heather, you were stationed at base camp. Can you share a little bit about um, your role there? Yeah. So uh, my role at Everest Base Camp was to um, collect an ice core from the Kumbu Glacier next to Everest Base Camp and also collect snow samples and stream samples from the glacial meltwater um, along the Kumbu Valley. And with these samples, we plan to look at different atmospheric chemistry and also pollutants, including uh, pesticides, heavy metals, and microplastics, so we can better understand the human impact on this environment. Perfect. Thank you, Heather. Next, we'll uh, talk about the three geology team members. First, Aaron Putnam. An assistant professor at UMaine, Aaron Putnam studies the geologic record of Earth's mountain glaciers and ice sheets to gain insights into the dynamics governing past global changes, such as ice ages and abrupt climate change. He's also interested in climate drivers and feedbacks responsible for the industrial age worldwide retreat of mountain glaciers and shifting global rain belts. Since participating in a scientific cruise to study the dynamics of Arctic sea ice in high school, Putnam has logged, logged more than 200 weeks conducting field work in remote glacial environments, including Antarctica, the Southern Alps of New Zealand, the Southern Andes, the American West, and the mountain chains of high Asia. His research focuses on charting the demise of Earth's terrestrial ice masses during the termination of the last ice age. His aim is, is to identify the climatic mechanisms that drove massive changes in the global energy budget and an overall goal is to improve the knowledge of cli climate dynamics and ice melt in a warming world. Hi, Erin. Do you want to talk about your, or your role as co-leader of the geology team? Sure. We, we had a tremendous opportunity at the University of Maine to participate in this, thanks this expedition, thanks to, to Paul's leadership and the National Geographic team. And we, um, we our geology team, using the the record and printed on the ground to study the history of the environment and climate change was, uh, well, involved not just our team here at the University of Maine, but also um, a geologist from uh, Kathmandu named Ananta Gajarel, who was essential in our success of our trip, and also Mary Hubbard at the uh, Montana State University. And ultimately, we had two teams uh, that involved our students from the University of Maine, but also six students from uh, uh, Tripovan University in, in Kathmandu. And we split off into two groups, going into different parts of the Kumbu region of the Mount Everest area. And um, one group was to, had the objective of, of coring lake sediments to, to uh, unearth environmental changes in the recent geologic past. And our group was charged with the task of reconstructing the ancient uh, fluctuations of the Kumbu Glacier, which is a glacier that monitors the upper part of the troposphere, almost to 
well, all the way up to the highest point on Earth, and and to see what we can learn about past climate changes from that, and also how though that information might help us calibrate our understanding of ice and snow in the Kumbu region and how it might respond to uh, future climate change. And so that that was our team, and well, Peter and Laura on our end. Do you know anything more? <laughs> That's perfect for now. Thank you, Anne. Um, next, Peter Strand. He's a PhD candidate at UMaine. He received his undergraduate and master's degrees here as well. Peter grew up in Yarmouth, and he uses mountain glaciers as thermometers to reconstruct past climate changes around the globe. Peter's current project is a comparison of the last glacial period in the northern and southern hemisphere, mid-latitudes, using <laughs> cosmogenic radionuclide surface exposure dating. <laughs> Peter's previous study areas include the Eastern Tibetan Plateau, Mongolian Altai Mountains, Southern Alps, New Zealand, Northern Andes, um, and dry valleys Antarctica. Thank you for using conversational language, Peter. <laughs> and could you talk a little bit about your role on the geology team? Yeah, sure. In addition to being a field scientist, I'm afraid that I'm also a bit of a laboratory nerd. <laughs> so I had two, two major roles in the expedition, and the first was to understand the modern response of the Kumbu Glacier, which is such an iconic glacier, and we did that by investigating some of the landforms around base camp. And so base camp itself, I don't know if you could tell from the images, but it's located on the Kumbu Glacier, and the surface of the glacier has lowered tremendously. So when Sir Ed Hillary and Tenzing Norgay visited in 1953, the elevation of base camp was about 45 meters higher. And in that time period, the surface of the glacier has lowered. And so we were studying some of the recent landforms that have been exposed to try to figure out if this retreat is unprecedented, both in human history, but also we can stretch that back tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. And then my second uh, primary goal was while Laura here was doing a lot of the hard work, Aaron and I were the primary drone pilots <laughs> of the expedition. So we would stake out a high ground, a high piece of land uh, when the weather was good, and we would fly our drones to collect uh, aerial imagery, videos to create, to help create those high resolution maps of the area. Great, thank you, Peter. <clears throat> And now Laura, Laura Mattis from Glenville, New York. She spent most of her childhood and young adult years exploring along the rapids of the Hudson River and the summits of the Adirondack High Peaks, where she developed an unyielding passion for adventure and for understanding the landscape around her. Laura pursued her bachelor's degree at UMaine in Earth and Climate Sciences. During her undergraduate career, she was a field assistant in Antarctica and New Zealand, working on the timing of deglaciations. These experiences inspired a passion for understanding glaciers and their place in the climate system. She's now pursuing a master's program at UMaine's Climate Change Institute, and she's advised by Dr. Aaron Putnam. Thank you, Laura. Can you talk about all the heavy lifting you had to do while they were flying drones? Uh, sure. So my primary objective for this is my master's thesis is looking at the geomorphology and so the landforms that were deposited by the Kumbu Glacier. And there were two areas in particular that we were interested in. One of them we thought uh, suggested a last glacial maximum position, which was out in Dingboche, and then the more uh, recent Holocene fluctuations, which is in the town of Loboche. And so a lot of what we did on this expedition was collect rock samples for beryllium nuclide analyses. So a lot of rock drilling and early mornings to go hiking and collect samples. And I noticed you have some samples over here too of that as well. Yes, that's Loboche <coughs> number 16. Uh, it's a nice loco granite, so feel free to look at that if you want. Thank you, Laura. Now we'll meet Mario Pataki, a, a member of the summit and glaciology teams. Originally from Poland, Mario is a PhD candidate in glaciology and climate science at the Climate Change Institute. His research involves using ice cores to understand past climate and atmospheric circulation. An accomplished mountaineer, Pataki has been a member of more than 20 expeditions to Antarctica, Kilimanjaro, and high altitude regions in South America and Asia. 
Pataki has led expeditions in the Andes, South Georgia Island, Sahara, and Gobi Desert. After he finishes his PhD, he'll become a postdoctoral fellow at the Climate Change Institute. And Mario, can you talk about your experiences on the, the summit team in particular? Thank you, Beth. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, as, as you said, yeah, <laughs> that was a great experience being part of a fantastic team. Um, Paul and Heather already described our uh, major goal, scientific goal, but um, my field goal was collect all samples, snow and uh, ice snow, uh, samples along the, to the summit of Everest and recover ice cores on the way up. Excellent, and Paul mentioned all of the wonderful photos that the National Geographic media team took. Actually, Mario's photos that he took ended up being on the, the cover of the magazine and, and throughout, so if you want to check those out, in addition to being a mountaineer and a scientist, he's an incredible photographer. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll uh, just kind of open it up, questions for, for everybody. Please jump in when you, you want to share a bit about it. Um, the first question, please, just describe your impressions of Everest. I know, Paul, this is your fourth time there. For some people, it was their first time, but just what did it look like, smell like, feel like? Just talk about Everest. Well, Everest is uh, its a unique place, obviously, very high up. Uh, but I think the best way to describe that is how different it is from uh, the first time I started working on the north side of Everest, where I've, where I've actually spent more uh, than on the south side. And it's uh, the north side's very dry. The south side has villages all over, has an amazing culture. You have the opportunity to go and see uh, llamas, the, not the animal, but the person uh, from the Buddhist culture. Uh, we spoke to them a lot to find out what they understood, not understood, I shouldn't even say it that way, what they could tell us uh, about how the climate is changing in that area. That was an amazing experience. Uh, the way most of the people live is not that much different, certainly, than it was 20 years ago, and certainly not that much different than, than perhaps a couple of hundred years ago. The only change that I noticed in the 20 years I've been going there uh, is the fact that they now have electri electricity. Uh, in the past, they had none, and that electricity comes primarily from hydroelectric power uh, and some solar panels. Uh, they have, there are many more people coming through. Uh, this tremendous pressure in, for the Sherpa people to participate in tourism, either carrying loads up to high elevations or helping climbing teams, but it's a very dangerous thing for them to do. A few years ago, 15 Sherpas were lost in an avalanche in the Kumbu, uh, ice fall, and there's a lot of discussion in their villages about whether or not they should continue to do this. Uh, many still do. They do it because the average salary for a person in the mountains in Nepal is about $800 a year, and if they carry loads and, and make their way to the top of Everest, they can make closer to three to $5,000. Uh, they're wonderful people, extremely bright. Uh, whenever we work with these people at high elevation, we always show them what we're doing at low elevation, and then we go up as high as we're going to go to work, start to do something, usually can't remember how to do it because there's not enough oxygen, and they take over and, and do it for us. <laughs> how about others? Mario, what did you think of the, uh, the ice fall and the view, what was Everest like for you? So first time I saw Everest in January during uh, training uh, expedition. So we went to Aria, we start planning our uh, next step, which was a uh, ride expedition in April and May. Um, absolutely amazing experience. So that time we didn't see any people in base camp because uh, that's early spring or you can call late uh, late winter, so no one's there. That was amazing. That, that I expected that place exactly this way. Very cold, very windy, wonderful view. And uh, when we came in April, it changed everything. <laughs> it's such a commercialized place right now, uh, and we expect uh, what people in Nepal expect as well. Just each season, we may have like more and more people. And um, Kumbu Icefall that was the biggest fear for us um, because that. That's the most dangerous place on the way up to Everest. So trying, we try to avoid uh, climb uh, Kumbu. At the beginning, we plan to do that three times. Then we reduce to one. But finally, on the end, uh, after first time, I decide to do like more. So <laughs> actually, I did it three times. 
Uh, it's a very charming place. It's um, it's very dangerous you feel because there's a place where you cannot control anything pretty much. You may have like amazing skills, you may climb fast, but there's many things that don't relate whatever you do. The avalanche or a huge block of ice just may fall anytime. So that's very scary, but as I said, they're charming. It's like you hear yourself. Hello, can you talk about being at base camp? It's been described as a tent city. It's got an emergency room and landing pads and movie theaters. And what was it like for you to be a, in tent city? Yeah, so when we were arriving to base camp the first time, it was in the middle of a snowstorm. And so we didn't see anything. Like we couldn't see a foot in front of us. So we all kind of like went to our tents that night. And then we woke up in the morning. That was kind of like when we the shock like really hit. You woke up and you're like, oh my God, there's so much going on. And you finally see the mountains and everything and the view is just absolutely gorgeous. Then you kind of turn around and there's just so many people, so many more than you would have thought there were. Um, and there's helicopters coming and going every few hours. I, I have to say the craziest thing that I saw was a helicopter leaving base camp and flying up to camp two. And with the mountains in front of you, they look big, but you don't really have a good perspective of how big they actually are. But when the helicopter flew up into the mountains and into camp two and just becomes this tiny little dot and disappeared it was it really kind of put it into perspective um but it was there was a lot of amenities amenities we had wi-fi um it was fifty dollars for a gigabyte <laughs> um so i mean you could we watched movies at night um but nat geo had a really good setup for us and so it was very convenient we had like breakfast and lunch and dinner very convenient and it was really good food for what it's worth at being at base camp. <laughs> um, they flew up soda and stuff too, so we weren't really, <laughs> uh, it wasn't too much of an inconvenience. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people got sick too, but there was a hospital, there was an ER um, right in base camp. I heard that there was a barber shop at base camp too. I didn't go to it, but yeah, there's <laughs> a lot more to be expected than, yeah. Geology team, did you have that same treatment when you were walking up? Well, after huffing and puffing and getting up there and being a little lightheaded, you had to crane your neck because not only is Everest just such an incredibly beautiful peak, but all of the surrounding mountains next to it are just incredibly tall. And when we got up to base camp, it was like a final sigh of relief. And uh, an interesting thing that happened there was we actually ran into a longtime friend, one of our friends from Antarctica, Michael Roberts, a mountaineer, was there and showed us what it was like um, in his tent area. So Nat Geo had this one incredible like compound of yellow tents and we were able to crawl over everything. It's a melting glacier that base camp is on, so we had to crawl over the uh, watery topography to get up there and we got to see him and have really good food over there too. So <laughs> it was his friend. Okay, shall we move on? How about um, your most significant takeaways as scientists? What are you able to, to do on the mountain, the science that you're able to conduct there? What are your takeaways? <laughs> sure. um, for me, the, the most, the biggest takeaway was just how fast this region is changing. So, how, how fast the glacier landscape was changing. You know, so that was that was my first time visiting, but certainly before I went, studied a number of historic photos, accounts, descriptions, and it just seems like even within the past few decades, the landscape has changed so dramatically, and that's because the glaciers are, are melting, they're being rearranged, and it's all because the mountains are warming so dramatically. And Paul spoke about what that means for the for the broader global context, but. I think that's why it's so important to bring back these images and these videos and photos that Mario takes. Is that's because when you see it for yourself, when you see it with your own eyes, it's dramatic. And I think we can help you know, deliver that message through our photos and videos and accounts. And it's really stunning and you know, it just makes you open your eyes and be aware that this landscape's changing so dramatically. If I can add something, uh, for us that was a uh, new territory to explore as a scientific point because uh, just before expedition we discussed this so many times that we can go there and can we uh, collect ice core at that elevation. 
So I think we open new doors. So right now we learn we can work at that elevation. So there are a number of other mountains uh, in that region that we'd like to work on and drill ice cores. So that, that was a very important lesson for us and new terra incognita. So, yeah. <coughs> I think um, one of the craziest things that I saw was just the actual impact on the Everest Base Camp area from humans. I mean, not only the fact that during um, climbing season that all these people show up, but also what they leave behind and how much they actually impact, say, the glacial meltwater streams. How are they could, how are they potentially polluting this area because there's so many people? Is this causing effect to the people downstream? And when you're walking around the um, penitentes on the glacier next to where you're staying, you just see trash, and it's really disturbing, and that's something I really wasn't expecting. The, um, have, having been in that area for quite a while, the thing that was most surprising to me, I know the glaciers are melting in the area, there's no doubt about it, uh, but even where base camp is at 17 and a half thousand feet, as Peter was, started, was saying, uh, there are rivers that run under that in the ice, and there are small ponds close to where people camp. And when you see karst topography, cars falling into, into roads or houses disappearing, this is exactly what's going to happen uh, on Mount Everest's base camp. There will be large sections that will start collapsing. The other thing uh, that is worthwhile noting uh, is the fact that the Kumbo ice fall is going to get more and more dangerous. The warmer it gets, the more likely the blocks will move around. The warmer it gets, the faster the ice flows. Uh, so before that mountain is totally deglaciated, which will certainly not be in the next few decades, but probably will in 100 years, it's, go it's going to be a much less stable place than it is now. It's a, in, one, in many ways, great analog for what's happening in the rest of the world. We're going through great instability uh, before we reach the next state of equilibrium, whatever that is. In terms of you talked a little bit about the science too, how did it affect you as, as people being able to participate in this expedition and the people that you met and the experiences that you've had, how has it changed you? Well, I have a very hearty addiction to Tiger Bomb after this <laughs> expedition. It is a natural cure-all for everything. Um, but I would say that it showed me, I'm so thankful for the university and for all of the opportunities I've had to be able to explore the unknown and do science in these incredible places. And it showed me that just how far you can really push those boundaries and when you put your mind to it, you can really accomplish incredible things. And the cooperation that we had with the, the local Nepalis along with our um, affiliates at the Trichandra University that was incredible and it just, it was inspiring to continue moving forward and do these really collaborative efforts and cross the disciplinary tracks to really make a lot of progress. On, on that note, we, we were very lucky to have had that collaboration and and from a personal experience, it was wonderful uh, being a part of that team and having the, the honor of working in that environment with those with the uh, people from Nepal. But it, it hit me in a, in a way that I didn't expect because it, it showed me how much work there is to be done on such an enormous environmental problem, perhaps the biggest of uh, that our generations will have faced, and how few people there are working on it. And, and we can only go to the Himalaya so many times, and um, it was just it was inspiring to see um, these up-and-coming young scientists from Nepal, working with them, learning from them, and sharing knowledge, so that this this sort of um, effort can continue, uh, not just a one-shot deal, but that people will continue studying the environment and trying to uh, come up with creative ways to mitigate the impacts of humans on climate and on landscape. Uh, it, was, it was wild. When we were walking up to base camp, you had to traverse these uh, steep moraine ridges. And you could have to look down on the surface of the ice now because it's, it's lowered so much. As Pete says, it's lowered by almost 50 meters uh, since Sir Edmund Hillary uh, set up the first base camp with Tenzing Norgay. And um, the other thing that's happening as a result of that is that the 
the stresses that the ice usually imparts upon the valley walls. It's the, the, the ice, the glaciers act like flying buttresses on a cathedral. And you remove those buttresses and things collapse. And so these moraines that we're trying to date, we're trying to figure out how long they've been stable, over the past few decades have become uh, unstable. They're actually collapsing in huge slump scars. Um, the, the valley walls are becoming unstable. The, the impacts are stretching beyond the, the limits of the glacier itself and into the actual landscape. And this is something we've seen in mountain environments all, the, all over the world. We're taking a greenhouse um, climate and kind of subjecting an ice age landscape to it. And it's, um, it's a remarkable experiment that's playing out before our eyes. It's incredible to watch, but I uh, hope we don't have to watch it too much longer. Just like to add something to provide a bit of perspective. So you see six very happy, relaxed people here. Uh, about a year ago, when we realized that we were going to be doing this, there's a lot to think about. Uh, it is a very dangerous place. Uh, in, for some people, they were going into a country that they'd never been in before, a culture that they uh, didn't understand. Uh, the fact that you're going into a place that has such low oxygen, uh, that has steep slopes, uh, that has food that you're not used to, uh, just spending the amount of time necessary to get yourself fit enough to go and not suffer from altitude sickness, which is either water in your lungs or water in your brain that disorients you, uh, is the sort of thing that keeps all of the people here up at night for months before you, uh, before you go. Uh, in addition to that, about 75% of us ended up getting influenza A uh, partway up the mountain. Uh, had to recuperate for several days from influenza A and then uh, some people went back up again. So there were a lot of moving parts uh, and in the back of your mind everybody's always thinking about how will I get the science done. But the bottom line is that although it is very comfortable at base camp now, <clears throat> when you're not at base camp, when you're anywhere else, particularly when you're very high up on the mountain above it, base camp, there are a lot of things that you have to uh, keep in mind. And you have to keep your wits about you. Uh, you're traveling at night a large part of the time. Uh, even simple things like drilling with a very sharp drill uh, that can cut you can end up being very serious. Uh, is your oxygen still working? Uh, has your oxygen mask frozen up? Do you have enough oxygen? All of these things, uh, none of the really bad things happen to anybody, but you spend nights and nights uh, before you go to these places. And so it's very relaxing to be home and have everybody home safe. Mario, can I ask you to talk about, um, you obviously had a very challenging job to do to, to get that ice core. And uh, you shared once how every night when you went into your tent, um, what you did to prepare for that. Can you share with everybody just the, the stress that you had going up the mountain? The biggest stress I, I had here, just before expedition. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so we, we had to solve a couple problems here at the University of Maine, just planning that expedition. Because as I said, that, that was new field for us, that elevation. We used to work in the Andes in Himalayas before, but not that elevation. So uh, we had to start simply with a uh, new drilling system. So it took us a lot of time to decide what type of drill uh, we'll use, uh, what type of power uh, we'll have. So here on the audience, we have a Don, but he was part of that team that helped us to develop that drill. Yeah. Um, Stand up, Dan. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> yeah. And a couple, couple other colleagues from University of Maine. So we used off-shelf drill, but we had to modify it. So it took time to prepare that drill for that expedition. Uh, we went to Iceland to test it. So when we were already, when I went in January to test the drill first time at this type of ice in high up, on high altitude, just we realized, okay, we are going good direction. But then later being on like proper expedition, always you have like a question on back of your head, just okay, so much effort, but then we are successful. What may fail? Just tiny little thing you may forget, and then nobody will run down to camp two or three <laughs> or, or one. Just you know, because everything happened so slow. And um, my biggest fear just just before drilling was that drill will perform right way, and then the power source survive that cold tem low temperature and for so long. So 
But then since I start drilling, I realize, oh my god, that's great. And I was like in euphoria, really. <laughs> and that's why everything happened in two hours. We were planning to spend six hours doing this, but bam. Fantastic team, great support of Sherpas, porters, and great team there, and support from Basecamp. Yeah, that was great experience. I love to bag. <laughs> and I'll also add, uh, the uh, automatic uh, weather station team, one person from Appalachian State, another one from Loughborough in the UK, uh, when Mario was talking about things breaking down, something did. It actually didn't break. They forgot a piece. Uh, they were up at 8,400 meters. That's close to 28,000 feet. Realized a small piece was missing, uh, but they had a shovel, which they basically used to tie the, the automatic weather system together. So the highest automatic weather station in the world is uh, held together basically with a piece of string and, and a shovel, and it's still working, fortunately. <laughs> Well, you mentioned you're all re relaxed here today. You're back, and also all your samples are back. The sediments, the stream samples, the snow samples, the ice core is now back at the University of Maine. So, so what, are, what are you doing now? Apparently nothing. <laughs> uh, that was very stressful as well, that yeah. part after expedition, waiting for ice core. Uh, it took six, six months. Uh, we've got promise that I uh, will see ice core just right after expedition, but all bureaucracy, all logistic problems took us. Uh, uh, we got ice core two weeks ago, even like shorter. So we had already plans uh, what we're supposed to do, but right now we verifying everything because some labs waiting for samples. Uh, they just we run out uh, from like schedule their schedule, and. Um, we slowly start pro uh, processing and preparing our samples, so I bet we'll have first numbers very soon, maybe end of December or early January, but like lots of other um, measurements waiting as well. And did you and Paul kind of guesstimate that that might be a 2,000 year old ice core? Is that correct? It could be. Uh, we're not sure yet. <clears throat> we're uh, looking into it right now. The other interesting thing about the ice core uh, is the fact that National Ge we transport ice cores from strange places all over the world on a regular basis, but National Geographic was obviously very interested in this ice core because it took a lot of effort, a lot of people, a lot of money, so we waited for a, an aircraft that could actually carry a refrigerator unit, and the only one that was available was Cathay Pacific, uh, and they were willing to ship that to Kathmandu, and they did, but unfortunately they had to go through Hong Kong. Uh, so, with all of the things going on in Hong Kong, we also had to wait for a while. And it's just a classic demonstration of how you can put years of work into something, piles of money, and then it comes down to something that's uh, obviously very, very critical and important, but something you never ever planned. Who would have ever imagined that some disruption in Hong Kong uh, could basically ruin a large part of our program? So, hopefully, everything in Hong Kong will work out well for them. And it, we got our eyes. So the, the rocks are a little easier to transport. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, but yeah, for us, it's this is just the beginning. So as Paul mentioned, everyone's back safe, and we're happy that the expedition was successful. And now we can really start to our processing and our analysis and uh, start to get to the root and start to answer some of these questions that, that Paul laid out. So we're really excited. We feel like this, this is just the beginning. We have currently 60 of the rock samples prioritized for the cosmogenic nuclide analysis. And we're also working on processing the drone imagery that Pete and Aaron were able to collect. Um, and so we're currently making digital elevation models and starting to map out the different landforms. And about 20 of the samples that we have are in the chemistry process and are getting ready to move on to the final phase where we can get an absolute age for that. And so once that's done, we'll be able to really um, move things forward. But as Pete said, we're in the beginning stages, but it looks really good. And then the final question I have is, um, how will your findings be used um, in Nepal, around Everest, and then the world? What, what difference could these findings make that you all learn about? So for um, pollutants, I'm working with Dr. Kimberly Rain, and we hope to create a risk assessment um, for the pollution that's occurring at base camp and potentially um, from distant sources as well. 
And um, And uh, from our point of view in the Climate Change Institute, as I mentioned early on, we're particularly interested in improving predictions for future climate. So along with the risk assessment that Heather mentioned, we'll add many other things done by other members of this team, the team, slope stability, a variety of other things. But we'll, we're also going to try to develop uh, an understanding of what in, will happen in the future. We all understand that by 2100, the temperatures could be three or four degrees centigrade higher, but it's not that simple. It differs where you are, where you are and it's not just going to happen linearly. The uh, loss of ice in the Arctic demonstrates that this can happen very fast. So we're going to try to perfect uh, the modeled information using the automatic weather stations, using the understanding of past glacier extent, using the ice cores to understand the chemistry and uh, try, we hope, uh, to come up with a series of plausible futures for these people that will help them to guide the direction that they go. And we do the same thing in other parts of the world, too. Just to add to that, we can, um, by understanding how the, um, the volume of ice ties into that and what the melt rates are and how they've changed in the past and previous climate changes, you might be able to calibrate how the actual ice that's being turned into runoff might change in the future, which is uh, important for local downstream populations, but it's, it's a huge population, as Paul pointed out. It's, um, it's on the order of 20 to 30 percent of the human population, so any changes to that environment will have ripple effects throughout the entire uh, global economy, and, uh, and so we can begin to provide predictive models uh, for how the water is going to respond in the, in the Himalayan, the, the Eastern Himalayas. I'll also mention the National Geographic in December has a short article that involves some of the work that was done, particularly the lake drilling, uh, talking about glacier floods. Uh, we've been, we, the National Geographic team just left us uh, la uh, a little bit earlier a couple of days ago, uh, they're putting together a 44-minute documentary that'll be aired on the National Geographic Channel in late spring. Uh, there'll be an issue in, I think, July, a National Geographic ma magazine dedicated to Everest and going all the way back to Hillary and then putting what we've done uh, in perspective. And then there'll be an awful lot of short features, podcasts, a variety of other things. So you'll hear a lot more from National Geographic about what happened on the expedition. Does anybody in the audience have a question? Yes. I'm interested in uh, what kind of uh, training you did here before you left. Did you train as a group? Uh, and also, was there any low oxygen uh, training or even instrumentation that you could do here before you went over? I did regular training, just I focused on that. That's it, what I was doing. Yeah, keep running. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, no oxygen training and yeah we test also our equipment in our low temperature lab but, but nothing special yeah. mm -hmm. and the oxygen yeah. Mario's just really fit <laughs> <laughs> somebody here and then back yeah um, I read the article that uh, August mentioned last night and it said that some of these ponds that are starting to build up that local people have been putting in rudimentary dams and trying to divert the water or control the overflow of it. Did you see any evidence of that? At, were you aware of this is at all at a low elevation? Uh, not too far away from uh, base camp are several uh, lakes that are are potentially going to burst. One of them is in the adjacent valley. Heather and I went over there. Uh, and it's true that uh, people are trying to block them. Uh, the government of Nepal is, one of the reasons that they block them is they provide hydroelectric power and they can manage them. But the bottom line is it's very expensive uh, and the government doesn't have that sort of money. And some of the biggest glacial outburst floods are from glaciers that are right on the border between China and Nepal. Uh, and we're hoping that as a consequence of this expedition, which also involved a collaborative activity with many of the people we work with in China, that they'll set up a system, in with an early warning system for these floods. Many pe people don't live in a lot of these places, but they're impacted when the water comes down. 
That's uh, probably the most pressing issue. There are hundreds of these potential glacier outburst floods. As I mentioned, 900 in the last 20 years have evolved, and there were a lot more before that. It's a very big issue. And that lake sediment, uh, the lake pouring that was described in that paper, the intention was uh, to be able to see whether or not these floods have occurred in the past and how frequently. And I think that record probably will go back two or 3,000 years. So it'll be a very interesting study. It's never been done before. I do have one question. So is there anybody in the storm indicator team, a scientific team in your expedition? Heather, you mentioned about there was a storm happened, right? A storm, yeah. Yeah. So from the atmospheric point of view, is there anybody help you to indicate that the storm is coming? Yeah, so actually we had um, Sean Burkle from uh, the Climate Change Institute. He would email us um, a report, uh, a weather report every week, I mean every day, to let us know what the projections were for storms, if there's snow coming, and they were typically very accurate. So we would have an indication of whether it would be, it would, a storm would come, but there wasn't, it was when we got there, there was quite a few um, snowballs. And then once it got like um, into May, it was actually really sunny during the day. We didn't really see too much down at base camp. Metal hydrogen peroxide is a storm indicator. Mm -hmm. We have a mass pit, and if we absorb that, you know, that will indicate the storm is coming. That, that was my study. So. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? interested in the equipment that you used <coughs> and how that's changed since even since urban in Mallory do you have a sense of what, what's the technology done in those years hundred years almost really it's evolved very fast our uh, urban and, and Mallory had uh, they took on their boots in order to climb up on the ice they put nails in the bottom of the boots. Now we have crampons, and I can tell you that in, even in the time period I've been involved in this, the quality of the crampons has changed dramatically. Uh, they wore uh, primarily wool clothing, uh, and we've gone through a period of wearing synthetic clothing, and now we're going back to wool clothing, because they were right. Uh, the oxygen tanks that they carried were very large, and they leaked quite badly. The oxygen tanks now are much smaller, uh, much more efficient, and perhaps most importantly, the equipment is much lighter than it was before. Uh, it would have been very hard for them to do anything close to what we did uh, with the size equipment that would have that would have been necessary. Plus, uh, the only uh, communication that Mallory had when we worked on the north side, as we were climbing up, we found wires, and those that was part of Mallory's telegraph system. That's the only form of, of communication they have. Now, of course, we have satellite phones. And, and as Heather mentioned, it's expensive to use the, satellite, to use the, uh, the Wi-Fi, but there's still Wi-Fi. So that's changed dramatically. Uh, and the, in or, when Hillary uh, and Tenzing did the climb, the successful climb in the early 50s, they started from Kathmandu. Uh, it took them about three months to get to base station. Uh, we uh, started, we flew up to about 3,000 meters and then took 10 days after that. And we took the 10 days because we were acclimatizing. So the, you know, they truly were in a much more remote area. And, and even 20 years ago, it was much more remote than it is now. So we're fortunate to have uh, what we have. Has there been any attempt to clean up some of the mess that all these climbers have left on the mountain? Again, I'll answer that because I've seen the mess uh, over, over many years, and the answer is yes. Uh, it's really impressive to see most of these areas, the, uh, the slopes are often covered with uh, oxygen tanks and all sorts of garbage, uh, but the Nepalese government has taken this very seriously, and, and when we were up there, the Nepalese army uh, was monitoring all, all of it. The base camp is, uh, has 1,000 people, uh, and it literally looks clean. Uh, by the time they leave. That was not the case uh, a few years ago. And if you go to the edge of the Kumbu Icefall where things have made their way down from higher up, you see a large uh, array of garbage that's been crushed as it went through uh, the Kumbu Icefall. Uh, that hasn't been cleaned up yet, 
uh, but it eventually will. So they've taken it very seriously. There's also a fellow who, uh, in Australia, I believe, who set up a program of uh, recycling, and uh, he's they're flying uh, trash. The the Nepalese uh, air force is flying trash down to him, and then they they sort it uh, cl and basically clean it, and are getting everybody who walks through that area to carry a kilo of garbage out as they go down. But that's already been sorted. So they're they're really beginning to think about these things. The north side of Everest is uh, is far more remote and in places much dirtier. How much does the oxygen tank weigh? Each single one is about five kilo, which is uh, 11, 12 pounds, the full one, yeah. And since you go higher, the oxygen lasts much shorter. So if you go higher, just full oxygen tank last four hours. If you are lower, you can just re reduce to like slower flow. It may last 12 hours, so. Uh, it seemed like there was a much greater uh, attention in the press <coughs> this past climbing season on the recreational climbers and all the dangers and problems they had. Do you see any impact, either positive or negative, between those between science and the use of the mountain by recreational climbers? How do those two worlds interface? I'll just jump in immediately the, the, and then pass it on. Uh, there are very few scientists that go there, uh, and it has become a very uh, popular place. You pay eleven thousand uh, dollars for a summit permit. Uh, and then you pay at least $40,000 to go along with a, uh, an expedition team, and you probably want to pay more than that to be safe, quite truthfully. So it's a, it's a very big uh, industry, and you heard a lot about it this year because somebody happened to get a good picture of somebody that we know uh, of the 200 climbers. Uh, there may not always be 200 climbers, but it's not at all uncommon to have 100 climbers in front of you. Uh, the first day I got to the north side of Everest, uh, whatever, 20 years ago, uh, was about two years after the, um, the very famous event on the south side, and 13 people were blown off the top of the mountain the first, the first time I got to Everest on the north side. So these things happen, but you don't always hear about them. So it just really it depends on who took a picture, and, and this was a particularly crowded year uh, going up, and it's becoming more and more popular. But in terms of intersection, is there any positive or negative impact on science from the uh, recreational climbing world? Well, both. Uh, obviously, uh, if there weren't so many people, it would have been much easier to do what we do. If there weren't so many people, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, sort of trying to uh, account for the contamination that they provide versus what's uh, normally there. On the other hand, Having the recreational climbers and the professional climbers there is great because in the case of the automatic weather stations, they won't last forever. Uh, and some of the things that can be fixed don't necessarily require people coming from the U.S. to fix them. Uh, it's very easy to train people who might guide to go up there on a regular basis. Many of the Sherpas know how to now how to fix some of these automatic weather stations. So uh, gradually there is a, a partnership that's building. And there's a very big field called citizen science that many many of us in the university are involved in, uh, in which you uh, enlist local people, uh, schools, uh, leaders in the towns to help collect information. The automatic weather stations are in, some of them are in towns and they're well guarded because of that. The people are excited about it uh, and they are connected with uh, the science in that way. Uh, there's a lot more discussion, I think, between scientists and local people, between scientists and the tourists there. So, like everything else, uh, when you have a common bond, like being in this university together or being on Everest together, uh, there's a lot more exchange. So, it's a good thing. I, I think it's, I prefer that not so many people went, but I think it's important that some people go because then you have ambassadors that care about the place. Speaking about ecotourism, we have brochures for a trip to South Greenland with Paul in June. I have a very limited number, but if Paul wanted to speak about that trip and what the students are doing in South Greenland, maybe you'd say a few words. Sure. Thank you for the advertisement. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we went to several researchers from uh, this university went to South Greenland last year, and 
the intention was to get everybody on the ground together, many different disciplines, and look for things that we could do that would be valuable. Greenland is changing dramatically. South Greenland is a particularly beautiful area with large, you can see the ice sheets, small glaciers, uh, sheep farms, uh, beautiful uh, fjords. So now that we have determined what we can do there, uh, several graduate students and undergraduates from the University of Maine, University of Southern Maine, University of Law School, the University of Maine Law School will be going there uh, to conduct experiments uh, and to do classic experiential learning. Uh, that'll be two weeks. There's a one week uh, trip uh, that will several of us will be involved in that is open to anybody who would like to come. Uh, Pat has brochures. And that would give you the opportunity to see South Greenland, which is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful area. Old Norse ruins, sheep farms, and all of the other things that I described. Uh, and you can live in comfort in a hotel and visit disintegrating glaciers during the day and then come back and have a, a nice brandy in the evening before you, before you go to sleep. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Yes, we got one more. I just have a question, like on a practical basis. Can you sleep well at night at <laughs> elevation? And the second question is, did you all get a Rolex watch out of this? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so at base camp, um, the only the major issue I had, and I was not aware of this prior to going to Everest base camp, was the amount of avalanches, even if they're small. They occur during the night, and it's so quiet at night that you hear these, like, it's like thunder, and you hear these crashing through the night, and that kept me up quite a bit, but that was, I mean, besides that, I actually sleep better at altitude. <laughs> I don't know why, but. <laughs> it's true. I had a hard time sleeping. I had a hard time sleeping, but not because of the altitude or anything, because I was always worried about our getting our students home safely and everything like that. It's a lot of personnel, you know, and uh, people to worry about, a lot of responsibility. And, uh, but in the end, it all worked out quite well. Pretty good team. Yeah. I can just um, the each night, and you, when you're going higher, just each night is getting better because of acclimatization. But, uh, I didn't know what to expect at 7,000, at 8,000 meter elevation, camp three and four. A little bit, um, when we're thinking about it, it was a little bit terrifying hearing, uh, wearing oxygen mask all the time because you're wearing this during, when, when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. But actually, those three, four nights, they were the best ones. Because, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the oxygen relaxes you and allows you to sleep. So I slept like eight hours straight. <laughs> Awesome. I think that will wrap it up. Thank you for everybody for coming, and thank you very much to the team for being here. Thank you to, to, to Beth and Adam Kirkendall and Ron Lisnett and Tammy uh, Crosby and Tanya Cody for putting all of this together. Thank you.